Lives of the Unconscious. A podcast on psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Episode 7. Is Psychoanalysis Scientific? The objection that psychoanalysis is not a scientific practice but rather a kind of religious community that, against all reason and scientific knowledge, remains loyal to the crude doctrines of its founder, Sigmund Freud, is as old as psychoanalysis itself. We will dedicate two episodes of our podcast to just this question. In the episode on the efficacy of the psychoanalytic therapeutic method, we will present some of the most significant findings from psychotherapeutic research. But today, we will first address fundamentally the question, is psychoanalysis scientific? That often is no benign question. It aims at the authority of psychoanalytic thought, that is, whether psychoanalysis is something that can be taken seriously at all, or whether it is something that can be cast aside. It is not uncommon for this doubt to be stated not in the form of a question, but rather in the form of an assertion. Psychoanalysis is not a science. This is the kind of sentence that psychology students hear a lot in their first semester lectures. Often the first, and for that matter, also the last thing to be learned about psychoanalysis in many places. In contemporary academic psychology, psychoanalysis, usually referring thereby only to a few of Freud's reflections, is frequently a kind of negative foil from which to differentiate oneself in the quest for attaining exact science, a straw man of pseudoscience, even though psychoanalysts are active elsewhere as professors in empirical research. Unscientific means here not in accordance with the ideal of scientific empirical research. In the history of psychoanalysis, however, the scientific question has been asked from very different perspectives. In the early days of psychoanalysis, it was deemed a boogeyman of the bourgeoisie, touching on dubious subjects such as forbidden sexual fantasies and thus undermining the bourgeois order, while to others it was something immensely progressive, a new science. Under National Socialism, psychoanalysis was considered unscientific insofar as it was not a German, Aryan science, but rather a Jewish one. Freud's writings were burned on university campuses in Germany in 1933. Psychoanalysis was widely received in the student movements of the 1960s, especially the writings of Wilhelm Reich. At the same time, Freud's work was suspected of being too oriented towards the natural sciences. For example, too materialistic or biological, and of failing to take sufficient account of the social causes of mental suffering. Within the socialist states, psychoanalysis was considered superfluous in many places, because, as was argued, the socialist state had abolished the contradictions between society and the individual, meaning people would no longer exhibit internal conflicts. For several decades, psychoanalysis was the leading science in psychosomatics and psychiatry, especially in the United States, and was even the hallmark of the medical psychiatric establishment before it received the verdict of being too tedious, too cumbersome, not efficient enough, and not able to fulfill certain economic demands in the fight against mental illness. In parallel with the radical economization of the healthcare system in many countries, Today, psychoanalysis is considered by some to be far too bourgeois and conservative, with, for instance, a much too static conception of gender identity, while at the same time, one of the pioneers of gender theory, Jessica Benjamin, is a psychoanalyst. Again and again, new currents and movements in different fields make reference to psychoanalysis. Neither the favorable nor the negative reception of psychoanalysis has been independent of social developments, just as interests, values, and conceptions of humanity are also always reflected in science, be it in which questions are asked 
or in the way they are asked. But neither is psychoanalysis itself static. Even within psychoanalysis, there has, over time, been continuous transformation, and various positions and currents have developed regarding the scientific question, about which we will hear more later. The sentence, Is psychoanalysis scientific? thus contains at least two generalizations that make it difficult to answer. First, the word psychoanalysis. It is certainly necessary to use generalizations like psychoanalysis, just like science or the Americans, so that one can even communicate. However, this should not mislead one to think that psychoanalysis is a homogeneous community of believers, all of whom are committed to the same principles. Even during Freud's lifetime, psychoanalysis was characterized by a diversity of currents, schools, and splits that all had different conceptions of the human psyche, treatment techniques, the meaning of the unconscious and sexuality, as well as different understandings of science. Sometimes the individual positions were so irreconcilable that they quarreled vehemently and founded their own organizations. According to legend, Freud refused to emigrate to Zurich after being expelled from Austria during the Nazi era, for this was the home of his adversary Jung. But even Freud himself repeatedly reworked and revised his own ideas over the course of his life. Jung, by the way, was one of the first to investigate unconscious processes by way of association experiments, say by timing the reaction speed to certain stimulus words a procedure not dissimilar to the so-called priming experiments in current social psychology. Today, there is a multitude of psychoanalytic schools and currents all over the world, not only in Europe and the U.S., but, for example, also in Latin America, India, and China, there is a lively scientific culture of psychoanalysis. There is an extensive body of empirical research literature on psychoanalytic concepts and therapeutic procedures, from research into prenatal states to palliative care, experimental dream research, neuropsychoanalysis, biographical research, social psychology and prejudice research, effectiveness and process research, to the broad field of developmental psychology where the general focus of psychoanalytic science perhaps lies. A number of important research papers and some of the most important international authors can be found linked to this episode. As in any field of research, there are results that support certain scientific hypotheses and others that have no empirical foundation. Psychoanalytic practice and theorization find in these pursuits one of their most important sources. Without the empirical infit research, for example, modern psychoanalysis would not be conceivable. Central concepts for treatment, such as the work with and in the therapeutic relationship, are based on how psychological structures develop through early bonding experiences. But the truth is that empirical researchers also have not always had it easy in psychoanalysis. There have certainly been currents, and indeed, they probably still exist in some places, that have locked themselves away in the ivory tower. We do not want to discard seclusion and introversion as a source of psychological knowledge. But however, when on top of that comes snobbery and elitism, then one is burning one's own bridges to the outside world. For example, and the presupposition that only those who have gone through a certain number of years of personal experience can understand anything about psychoanalysis, or that highly frequent work with patients on the couch is the only truly profound and serious psychotherapy, the couch declared to be a kind of psychotherapeutic shrine. In this way, psychoanalytic knowledge becomes a cult, i.e., a shrouded insight available only to the initiated, usually associated with a form of organization that has an authoritarian character, led by analysts whose interpretation and debates are granted sovereignty, who can distinguish between correct and incorrect methods, good and bad interventions, 
analytic and unanalytic practices. As much as these isolationist tendencies can be explained by external pressure, and for sure, they are to be found in nearly every institution, including science, at the same time, it deprives psychoanalysis of the best it has to offer, namely, the joy of knowledge, independent thought, a living understanding of oneself and others. An intensive encounter with oneself is without a doubt an unavoidable part of psychoanalysis. After all, psychoanalytic thinking is never a cult, but is related to the experiences, perceptions, and observations that one has in one's everyday life, of oneself and others, from dreams to conflicts and relationships. One's own living experience is the source of all psychoanalytic knowledge. The word empirical comes from the Greek and means coming from experience, based on experience, which does not exclude the fact that a long therapeutic practice means a great wealth of experience and that there are also areas of psychoanalytic science which are very complex and require exhaustive study. The criticism of and aversion to psychoanalysis and the psychotherapeutic landscape in favor of other methods, such as behavioral therapy, was, if a psychoanalytic interpretation is permitted, perhaps a necessary process within the family of psychotherapy to break free from the dominance of the parent generation. If nothing else, this conflict has helped psychoanalysis to come to terms with its own institutions, procedures, and therapeutic foundations. The blanket accusation, psychoanalysis is unscientific, is certainly not much more than a prejudice, which in some places only endures because no dissenting voices are heard. It is taught in some universities that psychoanalysis has nothing to do with empirical science, while three buildings away from that lecture hall, under the roof of another department, there is a psychoanalytic research center in operation. One can only hope that a younger generation of researchers will dismantle these reservations and enter into a productive dialogue, of which, fortunately, there are already successful examples. Psychoanalysis is ultimately a much too heterogeneous and multi-layered term for generations of researchers and practitioners around the world. Criticism of psychoanalytic concepts and empirical research is not only legitimate, but necessary for psychoanalysis itself. But one may very well make the distinction between whether there is a serious interest in the topic and whether scientificness is used here to mask a prejudice, to prove the superiority of one's own approach and to convict others in a kind of inquisitional court of inferiority. It is known from prejudice research that the psychological basis for the sweeping denigration of others is often one's own insecurity. A rich mind is open to the most divergent forms of thought and is discerning in its judgment, and by this standard may professors also be measured. But now a word about the second generalization in the sentence, is psychoanalysis scientific? Namely the word scientific. What does that mean? This question fills libraries, and for sure, it cannot be seriously answered in a single podcast episode. We would like only to set forth an excursive train of thought. With regard to the criticism of psychoanalysis today, a specific kind of science is usually meant, namely the scientific ideal of the natural sciences. They are also called the exact sciences such as physics, chemistry, biology, and as their more or less accepted stepchild, experimental psychology. Psychoanalysis has, of course, also found its way into other areas of study with different conceptions of science, such as sociology, philosophy, ethnology, art, or literature. But as we heard, Psychoanalysis has also contributed to the field of experimental and empirical psychology. However, equating science with the methodology of the natural sciences is definitely questionable.
methodology in itself is not scientific. Method has no value of its own, but is only meaningful in relation to the object of study. In physics, surely the leading discipline in the exact natural sciences, this object is first and foremost inanimate nature. This object, say the motion of stars or the current in a circuit, behaves in a law-like manner, such that it can be described well with mathematical models, as in a stochastic model, albeit with limitations that, in a sense, become visible in the smallest particles of matter and the largest cosmological models. Yet within these limitations, it is still possible to integrate a substantial amount of individual empirical findings into consistent fundamental theories. Quantum theory, the theory of relativity, laws of nature. But here too, not into a theory of everything, but rather with still irresolvable contradictions. But even so, the methodology and the object are in such agreement here that, for example, the motion of the moon is so predictable that one can calculate its orbit, launch a rocket straight for it, and land on it. But in the final analysis, the methodology can only be as exact as the object's behavior is law-like. That is in accordance with the principles of mechanics. The question is whether this also pertains to the object of psychological science, i.e. the human psyche. Does the psyche behave in a regulated manner so that a comparable methodology can be applied to it? Perhaps it can be said that the human psyche, at least in certain areas, behaves predictable enough that it can be grasped with this kind of scientific methodology. Otherwise, empirical and experimental psychology would not be able to make predictions. Surveying a thousand people suffices to infer the voting behavior of millions. At the same time, despite a hundred years of experimental research in psychology, there are no grand theories or laws of nature for the psyche in which the myriad of individual findings can be integrated. And also, as a result, no technical successes which would even come close to approximating the moon landing or similar achievements. Perhaps because object and methodology do not stand in a comparable relationship of identity after all. The method borrowed from the natural sciences can only arrive at some aspects of the mental. The psychoanalytic understanding of science, one suspects that even here there is no uniform position, is not a matter of rejecting the scientific experimental method, but instead of making room for other approaches. The human psyche may not behave quite like the moon's orbit after all, and can only be comprehended to a limited degree with mathematical models, including probability calculations. The crucial difference is perhaps that people adjust their behavior on the basis of interpretations. They act in situations because they understand, i.e. interpret, what is happening in a particular way. For example, a situation makes one afraid because, for some reason, whether justified or unjustified, conscious or unconscious, they take it to be dangerous and take themselves for too weak, too helpless, and so on. The human psyche is not simply a fact of nature, but is rather, if you will, a self-interpreting fact of nature. Unlike the moon, which traverses its orbit without reflecting on itself or the earth. In this self-interpretation lies perhaps the very essence of the human psyche. And within this interpretation also lies its dazzling diversity. For how people understand themselves depends on all sorts of possible conditions. Sometimes rule-like and predictable, for example, because they all share certain social norms, or a similar biological sensory system, while sometimes others are very individual, for example, by virtue of the experience of our own individual life story.
in order to do justice to this, one would have to, as it were, postulate for every human being their own separate natural law, and also continuously modify it. For after all, the story of our lives goes on. In the words of Friedrich Nietzsche, only that which has no history can be defined. But we have one. People alter their behavior when they bestow a different meaning to situations. If it were otherwise, therapy would never work. This is why the design of a psychological experiment requires concealing from those involved the purpose of the experiment. If they knew what it was about, or even just that they were being observed, they would behave differently. Natural science oriented experiments must directly rule out this individuality. The researcher can do little with the fact that, when asked to either press the left or the right key, the test subject takes an interest in the brand of the notebook, say an apple, and as a result, is reminded of a certain event in their life. The individual, the respective interpreter of the situation, is a disruptive influence that must be minimized as much as possible so that reasonable results can be obtained. And the same applies to the subjectivity of the researcher. The interpersonal encounter with all their mutual ideas and influences is just not desired. But is it therefore irrelevant? Wouldn't this association about the apple be the most interesting thing that could be used in therapy to gain access to the person's experience? That which only he or she is thinking and feeling at that moment? There may well always be a dichotomy between generalizing statements and individual experiences. Just as therapeutic practice can never be completely dissolved into a universal method. It always involves something incomparable, unrepeatable, that cannot be conveyed in scientific formulas. The life of a human being. Statistics include everyone, yet as individuals, no one. Psychotherapy is therefore not only a standardized method, it is also always, in some way, a kind of art, improvisation, that is, an action in which something singular happens. After all, one also speaks of the art of healing. Nevertheless, there are also scientific approaches that attempt to come close to this domain of the psychological, tapping into the meaning of actions, feelings, and thoughts is the object of these interpretive approaches. One also speaks of hermeneutics or the art of systematic interpretation. Psychoanalytic sciences, here in exchange with other social sciences, have developed their own procedures. Well-known examples are the so-called depth hermeneutics, but also the so-called dream coding methods, biographical narrative interview methods, or the multifaceted approaches of the San Francisco Psychotherapy Research Group, which has been very influential for psychoanalytic psychotherapy research. We will hear about these various procedures in yet other episodes. Within the sciences, these approaches would also be classified as qualitative methods. And yet, theoretical reflection also takes on a different meaning in this context. Theory is not just speculation or the formulation of unproven hypotheses. It is always also an attempt to develop a language, concepts, and basic models of thought that make mental experience accessible. Freud's greatest achievement was perhaps not in formulating experimental psychological hypotheses, but rather, above all, in creating a language that makes it possible to describe a realm of human experience and suffering for which there was previously no language, to seek meaning where previously one had only spoken nonsense. Even today, 
we still use psychoanalytic terms and concepts in our everyday language to describe certain phenomena of our experience, as and when we speak of repression. Freud was first and foremost a great wordsmith. He made concepts fruitful for the clinical practice and therapy of the mentally ill that until then had only played a role in philosophy, such as the unconscious. Incidentally, we use many terms that help us to describe our experiences, even if they cannot be verified in the laboratory. For example, the word I, which no clearly definable center in the brain can account for, but which, nevertheless, does exist as such in our psychological experience. Ultimately, the work of translation from one language into another is always necessary between empirical research, clinical practice, and subjective experience. With every translation, however, something is lost, just as the essence of a poem disappears when translated from German into English. That which makes sense in working with patients is not necessarily that which can be reproduced in laboratory experiments and vice versa. And, of course, like a good translator, the researcher must be very well versed in both languages to avoid gross reductions and misunderstandings, which, regrettably, often happens with poorly understood psychoanalytic concepts. Empirical sciences are an important companion and supporter of therapeutic practice. Psychoanalytic concepts should always try to reflect critically through the methods of empirical science, be that hermeneutics or experimental psychology. Psychoanalytic scientists working in empirical research do just that. However, natural scientific forms of thought cannot give us an answer to all questions such as those posed by clinical work with patients, or, quite simply, by everyday life. They too need a language, metaphors, images, so that the translation into everyday life can be successful. A number does not speak for itself, but must always be interpreted. And we should not anticipate some redemptive truth from the exact sciences nor should we overload it with too many expectations. Or, in the words of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, we feel that even when all possible scientific questions have been answered, the problems of our life will not even have been touched upon. This podcast is written and produced by Cecile Lutz and Jakob Müller. Translated in red by Solomon Lawrence.